just want to begin by saying God bless Kathy Lamb, who from the first day I was at St. John's leading a retreat up at Sarah Retreat in Malibu, Kathy was playing her mandolin. And she's been like the soundtrack of my years here at St. John's, playing music uh, at every event that I can think of at our church. And uh, we're just bringing that viola with Julie today, who's not feeling well actually today. So thank you again for joining us today in the sanctuary and online this morning as we come to the last of a series of messages that I've been preaching called Journey into Freedom. And it was inspired by a book called uh, uh, the Interior Freedom by Jacques Philippe. Many of you have been reading that. And the words of the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Right now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6 as we come to the end of this series. And uh, the title of this message is The Need to Be, The Need to Be Free. From Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 19, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Oh Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. May it come to us afresh, and may our hearts be freshly open and ready to be changed and even broken and transformed by you again. Do it again, Lord. Give us some fresh bread today as we seek to walk with you faithfully in these amazing times in which we live. Lord, give us strength and power and grace to serve you well and to love one another in our journey into freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the deepest needs that we have as human beings is for identity. It's to know who we are. It's to have a deep desire also to be seen, to be treasured by others and ourselves. We want to live, we want to exist, we want to be in a way that's authentic and real, in a way that truly matters to the people around us and to ourselves. We long for that place where our need to be will be safe from all harm. And I want to explore this idea of identity this morning, because it's so important in our culture as well. Because there's a lot of places that we may look for identity. And I want to look at some of those right now. We can look for our identity in the sum of our possessions. And we know that that can be a major way that we find a sense of meaning. Defining who we are by where we live, or by the car we drive, the size of our bank account, a certain kind of lifestyle. How do we measure our worth, though, after the stock market crashes, or we are replaced by a robot at work. I don't know how many have experienced that yet, but uh, they say it's coming to a lot of us. I don't know about pastors. They may even find a virtual pastor. And our house is devastated by a California wildfire. Some of us have lost homes in fires, even in the sanctuary. It may not all happen in the same year, of course, but a lot of those things can and do happen. So in the sum of our possessions, a lot of us find meaning, identity, but how about in our physical appearance? How we feel about ourselves may be greatly influenced by the idealized and heavily filtered images that we see all the time around us on television, on social media, on film, in magazines. But what, God forbid, do we do if we're disfigured in an accident or we're simp- we simply conclude that we'll never look like whatever that idealized image is that we've made up in our own minds and that we see or imagine around us of physical beauty? Or how about our unique personal talents? A lot of us really treasure and value the unique gifts that we have, and we should. We may be very gifted athletically, artistically, or academically. Imagine, though, if you're a professional basketball player. How would you see yourself if you ended up then in a wheelchair years later. Or say you're a brilliant professor and you suffer 
memory loss because of an accident or a disease. Who are you now to yourself and to other people? And then again, say you're a master painter who suddenly goes blind. What becomes of your sense of identity then? Many of us look for identity in our social or our religious group or our party or our cause. And I have to say, some of us as Christians find even more sense of identity in some of these things than in our own faith, if we were really honest with ourselves. They can give us a powerful sense of belonging. But what if our social circle betrays us? What if somebody on social media disgraces us in front of our friends? What if our social circle or our church fails to live up to our ideals? What if our church fails us? Or what if our church leaders fail us? What if we discover the leader of a nonprofit is misappropriating the donor's uh, contributions and we've given a lot to that? It happens. And it shakes us again in our sense of belonging. And finally, many of us define ourselves in terms of the good that we're able to do. The, the ways that we invest our time and our lives in our communities. In any number of roles in our families. Inevitably, we come to the point, though, where we disappoint ourselves. Or we disappoint the people around us. We fall short of our dreams. Or we don't achieve what we hoped or dreamed or imagined we thought we would, we would achieve or accomplish. Father Jacques Philippe shared about a time when he was feeling particularly low and ineffective in his work as a priest. And when he shared this in a time of confession, listen to what his priest said to him. When you no longer believe in what you can do for God, believe in what God can do for you. Let me say that again. When you no longer believe in what you can do for God, believe in what God can can do for you. And as Christians, we would also say, and what God has done for you and is doing for you right now. That's because eventually in our search for our identity, we all hit the wall. We all hit the wall. The wall is that moment when because of trials or failures or feelings of helplessness or sickness, or low feelings, or weakness, or doubt, or disillusionment, or questioning, we discover that none of our false identities can deliver us. They all fall short. They don't help us get over the wall, or under it, or around it. We know that we have to go through it. And healing comes by accepting ourselves in all our weakness, in our humanity, remember that. Number two, forgiving ourselves and others. This is so important. My spiritual director shared these words from Florida Scott Maxwell. You need to claim the events of your life, listen to this, you need to claim the events of your life to make yourself yours. When you truly possess all that you have been and done, which may take some time, you are fierce with reality. I love that. When you truly possess and name it and speak it, all that you have been and done, which may take some time, you are fierce with reality. I told my spiritual director, I'm still working on that. <laughs> I'm still working on that. What helps us to do this is the boundless love of God who knows us and loves us let's face it, much, much better than we know ourselves. And to put it another way, when I'm not sure what to believe about myself, I can believe I am made in God's image, that I am a beloved child who owns nothing, who receives everything, who is loved infinitely, who was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world and destined for eternity. As we enter the Advent season and think about Jesus and the family into which he was born, I'm, I'm reminded again of a stone ossuary. I'm looking at Kevin here because I know Kevin loves archaeology. So I'm thinking about this story again. 
I'm reminded of this stone ossuary. It, a stone ossuary is just a bone box. It's the box that they fill bones with, especially in the ancient world. It was only, there was one in particular recently discovered in Jerusalem with this inscription, James, the son of Joseph, the brother of Jesus. James, the son of Joseph, the brother of Jesus. So, of course, people saw that and they wondered, could this be the ossuary bone box of Jesus' brother, James, the head of the church in Jerusalem? What an incredible find that would be. Closer study of that box yielded varying opinions, you, you can imagine. Many prominent scholars embraced its authenticity. Uh, a Duke University professor considered it the oldest non-literary evidence of Jesus' life now available. But later examinations seemed to prove the inscription was a disappointing forgery until the accident. Until the accident. When the ossuary was shipped to the Royal Ontario Museum, the limestone box broke into five pieces. But the good side of that is that it made it possible because it had broken, to study in sophisticated ways that ossuary box, it would have been impossible if it had been intact. And the Biblical Archaeology Review reported these new findings. The studies we conducted have convinced us that the ossuary and its inscription are genuinely ancient and not a modern, modern forgery. Now, why do I tell that story? Well, it's because I think like this stone box, a lot of us feel like a forgery, <laughs> a fake, like we've hit the wall for whatever reason. You may even feel like it's been shattered into several pieces as you think about your life and who you are, but in the end, that testing reveals a truth about who and what we are in God's eyes as we are sustained by his grace and power, that you are a genuine child of God and not a modern forgery. As James himself would have said, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. The identity of a truly free person, Jacques Philippe writes in, in his book, he says, we seek freedom in possessions and power and in clinging to a certain identity or perception that others have of us, but the only truly free person is the one who has nothing left to lose. Nothing left to lose. He relates a story of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who expresses this truth in a book he wrote about, an autobiographical book in many ways, called The First Circle, which is set in a prison. Imagine a time when Stalin was still in power and uh, this man was in prison. A highly placed party official needs the services of a prison inmate who is a scientist. He needs this scientist for a project he's been put in charge of and on which he is risking his career. The party official tries everything he can to persuade this prisoner to help him. But even though the scientist will suffer even worse imprisonment, if he chooses not to play along, he refuses to do so. Prepared to go back to Siberia rather than further a system that has caused so much suffering. An incredible story. Solzhenitsyn shows that it's not the party official who is free, it's really the prisoner who has nothing of earthly value that he cares about more than his humanity before God. And it's helpful to know that this is an autobiographical story. It's much of what Alexander Solzhenitsyn experienced himself in his youth. He lost his faith in Christianity, and he became an atheist, and he became a commander in the Red Army. But when he wrote a private letter criticizing Joseph Stalin, he was sentenced to eight years in prison. And as a result of his experience in prison and labor camps, he returned to his faith. And he became a devout Eastern Orthodox Christian. And he learned the truth of Jesus' words, that nothing on earth can destroy the treasure or the heart which has been entrusted to God. Remember Paul's words again. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. 
Paul said, but the greatest of these is love. We've been talking about identity this morning, the desire we all have to be seen and to be known and to be loved and to be set free, to be all those things. I was talking with my dad, and he shared an amazing story about a woman named Darcy Calkins. She's the daughter of two Monte Vista Grove residents. My folks live in a retirement community where pastors and missionaries have a, an incredible uh, community together in Pasadena. And her parents, Bruce and Linda, shared the story with him. Darcy is a public defender. She's an attorney in our area for those who can't afford to be an attorney. And she describes her profession as a calling, a ministry to victims of poverty and to discrimination. And her dad, Bruce, contacted Darcy when the media tech at the Grove, who also works part-time at San Marino Community Church, it's a very wealthy church in a very wealthy and exclusive community, got into some trouble. We'll call him Florencio. Florencio was driving to work at the church in San Marino one day when he was stopped by the local police for no apparent reason. They wouldn't accept his explanation about working at the church. They searched his car for drugs and weapons. They found nothing. But then they ended up citing him anyway for playing his radio too loud. <laughs> he was listening to a recording of the program he had just made for the San Marino Community Church in his car. And so he was ordered to appear in court. And the day he was ordered to appear before a judge, he was discouraged. But Darcy was with him. And not only Darcy, there were several members of the Monte Vista Grove community as well, ready to be, ready to be called as character references and work references for Florencio. And listen to this. The judge took one, took one look at Darcy and said, case dismissed. <laughs> case dismissed. He knew her, and as he knew her, he knew that the one that she represented was a man of integrity. I just want to say, are you doubting yourself, or are you wondering if others question or doubt who you are as well? A lot of us go through that at some point. Perhaps you lack power or influence for a lot of different reasons. It could be race, it could be background, it could be social standing. It could be because of your age or your experience, or you could fill in the blank. Do you feel condemned because of your past or the wrongs you've done? Maybe condemned by yourself. Remember who stands beside you this morning. Remember that Jesus is standing there with you. He is the judge, as one theologian said, the judge who stepped down and who was willingly judged in our place. And he steps down from that high chair to be our advocate. He lived and died, and he rose again. And the Lord is here right now standing with you again. And he knows you better than you know yourself. He invites you to place your heart and your heart's treasure in his hands. Your whole life. You belong to him. And I want to invite you to do that right now as you think about who you are, as we think about who we are as a church, <clears throat> and our place in this community in this new century, in this new season, in all that we've been through together, who are we? And what is Christ calling us to do as we follow him? Let's remember that we are his children and that he is our advocate standing with us as we walk with him into the future, as unknown as it may be, and that we're safe and secure in his arms. May God reveal your belovedness to him today in this moment of silent prayer let's go to him and ask him to speak to us afresh <clears throat>